25 years ago, after graduating in Canada, I began my asset management career at Fidelity. And at that time, Fidelity was the world's largest asset managers. And this gentleman, not Mr. Graf, although white hair, is Peter Lynch. Uh, Peter Lynch, managers of the Magellan Fund, who made a lot of middle-class American families into millionaires. And one of his investment maxims is, know what you own and know why you own it. And I will look at the China bond through this lens to walk you through China bond subject for the next 30 minutes. We always say, you, you probably heard this, too big to ignore about China. But then I have these questions, how big is China? Or how big are we talking about in what regards? China is around 200 times bigger than Switzerland. And in the middle, I have a two-scale map to put Switzerland in the center of China near Shanxi. So you have a perspective of this country in terms of scale. And also, you probably know, um, in Switzerland, you have around 8 million populations. I came from Hong Kong with 7, and China is a country of 1.4 billion. However, it's not only about size and populations. China is also a fast-growing economy. Here, from top, you have United States, Western Europe, which I gather everything in it, because once I break it down, they are not that big. China in the middle, Asia ex China, and lastly, emerging market ex Asia, which predominantly emerging Europe and also Latin America. First of all, I want to talk about growth. China in the middle, in the past five years, the economic growth actually grew almost uh, 50%, uh, 30 percent, and it had grew from 11 trillion U.S. dollar to 17 trillion. And by proportion, to the very bottom of emerging Europe and Latin America, which has much lesser growth, but this is not the point. The point is China's significance. When you compare the lighter color back in 2015, China was around 65% of Western Europe, 60% to America, and now China actually is 80% of Europe and 75% of America. So the growth rate and also the significance is clear. And China is not only about economy growing fast, it also has a faster growing bond market. And here on your left is 2015, and on your right is five years later. And for the global bond market, it grew by 38%. And at the bottom is United States. Being the world largest bond market, it actually grew 50%, very impressive. And China made a double of its scale. And at the same time, for the other emerging markets, they have sub-growth. They are not even 38% growth. And you could recall, for example, in a couple years back, Argentina. Like some of the Latin American countries, they are overly dependent on external debt, uh, so they are not investment grade. And also, um, they have a lot of volatility uh, which prohibited their growth. So I attribute all this growth to the beginning of renminbi liberalizations. 
and I started it with IMF Special Drawing Right. So back in November 2015, IMF decided to include renminbi into SDL basket, basically based on two major considerations. You have to be one of the top five world exporters, and you have the currency that is being used in major uh, trade transactions or in market settlement. And China were able to include that. And IMF is going to do a review. They postponed the review, and they're going to uh, review, uh, announce the review decisions middle of next year for any changes to the basket. And then they will make it effective on 1st of August. I'm not here to speculate, but I would say the potential for renminbi to continue to grow from the current stage is high. Then from renminbi uh, liberalizations, we have index inclusions. Um, here uh, on, your, um, on your left, <laughs> so, yeah, on your left, uh, we started with um, Barclays Global Aggregate Index. It has started back in 2019. It's already done 7% um, China weight in this index. And in the middle, you have emerging market diversify, uh, about 10% China weight. And it is also done since 2020. And next month, FUSI World Government Bond will start including China over the next 36 months. And we anticipate will be around 5% of China weight. For all this passive flow, we are talking about 300 billion US dollar going into China bond market. And in the last year alone, uh, 2020, uh, there was about half of it, 150 billion US dollar went into the China bond market. Uh, about 60% in government bond, and then another 35% in um, something we call policy bank bond. However, foreign participation remained very, very low. When we look at the past three years, the amount of foreign participation actually has increased uh, in US dollar term. However, we are not making a lot of penetrations or foreign participations in, the, um, uh, in percentage. Uh, for, uh, for the Chinese bond market, compared to other development market, you have around 27% foreigners holding US treasuries, uh, another 28% in guilt, and you have 44% in boons by non-euro investors. However, purely looking at government bonds, um, government bonds foreign ownerships in China is only 10%. So I try to explain, or I try to find a reason why, and I attribute that to history. Um, you are a development market bond investor. When you first started your home country diversification, you start with another development country because you feel comfortable. And then you want to take risks, so you diversify over the different segment across the risk rate like from investment grade to high yield. And back in the 80s, by the sponsor of the Americans, um, Latin American countries were able to issue Brady bonds, which became what we invest in the emerging market now, the emerging market bond index. At that moment, there was no economy as big as China. At that moment, China actually was closed for business, and foreigners wasn't able to really assess that. So now I'm going to look at it from what you own perspective. And I try to describe the China bond market from an access approach. Um, it's a very messy bond marketplace because a lot of people are talking different things, typical emerging trend. 
Um, but I try to look at it from a historical access perspective um, to share with you. So I look at this market from three different segments. A is the offshore, means outside China in US dollar bond. And they are a mixed bag of Asian companies and Chinese company. That will be around 50% of issues from Chinese company. And they are also international rating agency rated. This is a one trillion US dollar market and you are familiar with it because of Jackie Index, something you already heard of. And then B, in the middle of the table, is offshore renminbi. So once again, outside China, but trade or denominate in renminbi. There is a very interesting mix of issuers in this universe. Once again, issues and issuers are rated by international rating agencies. However, it is a very, very small slice of the big pie. <laughs> Lastly um, is the red color onshore renminbi bond market. So this time it's in China, in renminbi. Naturally, Chinese issuers and rated by local rating agencies. And it is a big market, relatively speaking, around 60, uh, 16 trillion. So what is the offshore US dollar bond market? It's widely diversified across different Asian countries, but predominantly Asia. You have sovereign or quasi-sovereign from Hong Kong, from China, from Korea, and you also have uh, some of the Chinese government bond in this index. So it's a, mix, it's a mixed blended index. And predominantly investment grade. So next is an interesting one. It's called offshore renminbi bond market. This is a market I describe it as bridging the gap. This is a market being introduced when the renminbi actually became, um, the, the renminbi earned by foreigners not being repatriated back to China. They're sitting around and then Chinese um, government as a policy want to develop their bond market and they created this niche market. And you may heard of it in a different name called dim sum bond. And this is interesting because once again, you have the Chinese government names in there, but then you have a Volkswagen, QNB, Barclays, um, and then you have um, Westpac Bank, or even UBS being issuer in this index. But it has to be in renminbi. However, I see the struggle of this market. The market was first introduced back in uh, 2010. There was about 26, um, 26 billion US dollar, um, around 13 issues to begin with. And then this market developed until 2016. Um, why? Because at the same time as a policy, China decided to open up uh, the China uh, interbank market for bond access in 2017. So there was a decline in issues, both value and also numbers. For the past three years, sort of plateau in terms of this market. However, I would say China's government is trying to rejuvenate it. Uh, next month in October, uh, Sunjun city government, which is a southern part of China, a special economic zone in Guangzhou, will issue the very first um, dim sum bond, about 700 million. So it will be the very first LGF 
uh, local uh, LGB, um, local government bond um, uh, being issued in offshore market. So I think the idea in a policy perspective is to keep generating or keep insuring so that international investors were able to add renminbi into their portfolio. Lastly, onshore renminbi bond market. This is a market, without talking about anything, we should first look at credit ratings. It is too good to be true because uh, you have 90% um, investment grade in all the light shade green. Why? Um, because the nine credit agencies onshore in China, they rate things differently. They rate positively on your asset size. So think about state-owned enterprise. And then they also rate positively on state ownership because there is an implicit guarantee. And they also rate less negative than the foreign rating agency on leverage. So naturally, you have a rating like this. So for international managers like BEA Union Investment, we redo the math. So this is a equivalent per se, conversion of local Chinese credit rating to international standard. Naturally, if you adjust it downward by six or seven notches, you, you should be about right. And if you are interested in the topic, I encourage you to use your phone, scan the QR. There, was, uh, there is a paper issued by PBOC and BIS back in 2017, uh, which is I found myself quite interesting. They did a very comprehensive study about the differences, the ownerships, uh, what is Modi's and Standard & Poor's are doing, and would they bring any impact to the credit agency market? So um, if you want to, you, you, can, you can scan the QR. Hopefully you are able to. So looking at the credit agency, we sort of have an idea about the misguided um, labels then let's take a look of this market. It is a very quick growing market. And actually I would say as a country, China has done a remarkable job in growing their onshore bond market in such a short period of time. But it's not only about scale. There is an ambition to emulate the variety in the US market as well. So here, is the structure of a typical onshore China bond market. You have around 22% from, um, from the local government bonds. And for this segment, basically no foreign investors participate. So one day when you look at prospectus, you, you read a term called LG, uh, VF, something like that, those are local government, you may not even know where is it, that local country, county, and they want to build a bridge, and then they issue a paper, a special vehicles, and this is something international asset managers typically don't participate. And then you have the red color, China government bond, and the policy bank. The policy banks are uh, Agriculture, uh, Agricultural Development Bank of China, um, um, and then also Development Bank of China, and Import-Export Bank of China. And this is most of the foreigners participating, around 10 to 15 percent, and this is also where most of our index inclusions are um, benefiting from this. And then the gray color, typical credit issues, and once again, international investors, we don't really participate because we are able to find better liquidity, also better yield from the offshore US dollar market, the A1 that I presented earlier. So this is the current structure of onshore renminbi bond market. I would say everything started because of a change, a, a systematic fundamental change. 
On your left, you have a system, the QV, the RQV, they are legacies. If you like to know more, you can talk to me. Started back in 2002, it was an approval quota regime. And China has moved to the Bond Connect system, which is uh, a fouling, no restrictions per se arrangement. And for accessing Chinese equity market or uh, capital market, including bond, I would say the game changer is actually uh, Chinese government allow financial institutions licensed in Hong Kong being custodian of Chinese asset. So that will give, actually that has given uh, a level of confidence to a lot of international investor. So I walked you through briefly, like what, what is China bond market? Then of course I want to share with you why do we need to own it? Or why do we need to consider it? It's the yield. You heard of it salient time from me, from every single speaker um, talking about China bond. On your left, they are the government bonds of the world and China bond, 10 years, 10 yield, giving you around 3% yield. You, have, you don't need to do anything. If you're benchmarking yourself to global aggregate index, benchmarking yourself to FTSE world index, or even uh, EMBI, you, you naturally will have it. However, you may have it to the max of 10% or maximum 15% if your manager is being very, very proactive. However, I would argue on your right, looking at the five years sharp ratios, comparing the onshore China bond, predominantly the government issues and the policy bank, compared to your typical EM sovereign, EM corporate, Maybe you should think about a tactical allocations. Maybe you should think about trimming your emerging market sovereign or corporate positions and then swap it with some sort of China exposures. It's not only about return, there's also a diversification benefit. You can read yourself, looking at the numbers, comparing to different asset class, and also the correlations. However, I think the key point I want to convey is as long as renminbi and the Chinese market is not 100% freely open to everyone, these lower correlations, lower volatility benefit should be here to stay, at least for the near term future in the next five, 10 years. Lastly, we need to look at it from a risk perspective, currency, because you are going to participate in renminbi market. And renminbi market has a bad reputation of rapidly depre uh, depreciations before they are accepted in the SDR basket. And I am using uh, CVETS, which is a trade basket of 13 different currency against renminbi instead of widely quoted renminbi against US dollar. And you will see the renminbi actually has been stable as in uh, ra uh, range trading. Of course, since um, COVID, um, it appreciate, but I would say simply because US dollar weakness is everywhere against every single other countries on earth. So when you do your renminbi investment in mind, um, the key thing is your considerations of renminbi positions and also the currency if there is no hash share class for you to prepare. So I want to kind of wrap up um, of, um, what I'm going to I, I share with you today. Um, China is a large economy with a very fast growing bond market and this trend will stay. China has to develop bond market to remove itself 
from a heavily bank sustained uh, financial system and also want to deter or control uh, the shadow banking system. So this is big, this is fast growing, this is going to continue. There are three different uh, markets for you to access. The longest around is offshore US dollar, which you possibly already participating, offshore renminbi, dim sum bond, and lastly, the biggest and very low foreign participation onshore renminbi market. Lastly, I would say this market at this juncture gives you an attractive yield to other government bonds alternative, and it has a lower correlations which bring you uh, the diversification benefits. So this is what I'm sharing with you about China bond. If you have any questions, you can send, um, send over, or I'm happy to uh, share with you uh, at the round table. So thank you.